Okay, thank you. I was hoping I got the highest microphone here, but I won't have that honor. <laughs> anyway, thanks for being here, yeah. because being here on a Sunday, uh, it shows you a real commitment to the cause, so I want to thank you for that. Some of you probably are happy not to have to go to church, but this, at this moment is probably a more noble cause. The, um, I want to thank uh, the country as well, Peru, this uh, beautiful country here and being in Lima and suddenly to see the country take such a leadership role is uh, well appreciated, uh, now more so than ever. Also I want to echo uh, Helen's uh, kind words, uh, but thank her for what she's doing to put this uh, issue of deforestation high on the global agenda. I think we made great progress in New York and I would expect the same uh, coming out of the uh, the two weeks here, and then to see Yolanda is on the panel as well, uh, representing and certainly to some extent, uh, undoubtedly, the uh, WWF and other organizations he's active in, which play an absolutely uh, constructive role in this respect. Uh, this is my first time for the global in the Global Landscapes Forum, but I promise you it won't be my last, because it uh, is a very uh, useful forum that you're putting together. The issues of forest and agriculture, and how we respond to them, and hopefully prevent climate change are obviously of critical importance. Now, not just in the political negotiations, which many of you will be focused on, but also in the global business. In fact, most of the CEOs I'm convinced of now know that their companies cannot prosper in a world with runaway climate change, and that's increasingly becoming evident. They understand the need to work with political, work, uh, political leaders together to address these challenges. Above all, these business leaders recognize that the cost of inaction is actually rapidly becoming greater than the cost of action. Now, for those of us in the food sector, like my company, we also know that climate change cannot be tackled without the fundamental change in the way in which agriculture, which in fact is the world's oldest and largest industry, is practiced. Commercial agriculture actually drove 71% of tropical deforestation in the last 12 years of this century resulting in a loss of 130 million hectares of forests. In fact, it contributes about 15% to global emission, more than the entire transport sector. These are the inconvenient facts, but the reality is there are others too. The global population still has to grow well above 9 billion people. 80% more food will be needed to sustain this growth. And the starting point isn't pretty either. Over 800 million people going to bed hungry, not even knowing if they will wake up the next day. Yes, we do have to produce more food. Yes, we do have to protect the forests and support the communities that depend on them. We cannot succeed in one of these challenges without succeeding in the other. But it can be done, and I see two clear things that we need to be doing to get there. One is to improve the smallholder farmers' yield and income. 45%, for example, of Indonesian palm oil uh, suppliers or farmers, if you want to, are cultivated, sorry, 45% of the land is actually cultivated by smallholder farmers. With the right support and partnership, they can actually nearly double their yield. That's just palm oil alone. It's probably more on many other crops. The other thing we can do, obviously, is restoring degraded land. This is one of the conclusions on the landmark report of the Global Commission of the Climate and uh, Economy, of which I had the pleasure to be part, and I'm glad that Felipe is coming here at the end of the day. In fact, in that report, we argued that just 12% of the world's degraded land, if we just took the 12% and restore it, we could actually feed 200 million more people, and we could provide incomes for these people to the tune of 35 to 40 billion dollars a year. Now we can meet the growing demand without any further deforestation through these two approaches. Here in Latin America, we already find terrific examples of leadership. Take Brazil. Its efforts that they have made uh, make it the world's leader in some extent in climate change mitigation, recognizing that more needs to be done. But deforestation is down 70 percent since 2005 with increasing food production, actually, by half at the same time. Mexico has pioneered a payment system for ecosystem services, reducing its rate of forest loss more than tenfold since the 90s. And El Salvador 
has made great progress with reforestation. Undoubtedly, these successes and many more can be replicated across the world. And it matters enormously to Unilever that we do so. Natural disasters, we just see another one on the television again playing in front of our eyes in the Philippines, many directly linked to change in climate, cost us as a company already over $300 million a year. We see the rising input cost, the more volatile cost, water scarcity, reduced productivity in many parts of the agricultural supply chain, all linked directly to climate change. Left unchecked, climate change has the potential to become a significant barrier to our growth and that of nearly every other sector. That's why there's a strong business case for taking climate change out of the value chain. From the use of renewable energy for our factories to reducing food waste across the value chain. And it's one of the reasons why we're committed to source 100% of our agriculturally raw materials sustainably by the year 2020. For Unilever, sustainable agricultural sourcing includes eliminating deforestation from the entire supply chain. Our priority is therefore to conserve high conservation value forests, forests with high carbon stocks, tropical forests on peat stores, and to ensure that the net quantity, quality, and carbon density of these forests is maintained when there are land use changes in the wider landscape. We're implementing at the same time a responsible sourcing policy that we're driving up the value chain to all of our suppliers, which requires free, prior, and informed consent for developments involving indigenous people. And we're putting a lot of effort into transparency and traceability at the same time. By the end of this year, all of the palm oil sourced for our foods business in Europe will be traceable to certified plantations. We've mapped about 1,800 of them as we talk. We're also working with the World Resource Institute. I have not seen uh, Andrew yet, but we're working with them to increase the transparency in our supply chain by enabling both us as well as our suppliers to use its Global Forest Watch platform. But we also need to work with others. Just doing this alone is not enough. We need to use the size and scale of companies like ours to galvanize more uh, significant transformations across the whole industry. And yes, this is happening. In 2010, the 400 companies of the Global Consumer Goods Forum, which have a combined revenue of over $3 trillion, pledged to eliminate deforestation from their supply chains and achieve zero net deforestation by 2020. Many companies, Unilever included, have followed up with detailed time-bound plans to deliver this. As the signal from purchases has strengthened, we've seen movements, not surprisingly, from growers and traders as well. Many major companies like Wilmar, Carr, or Gargill have now committed to no deforestation policies. These three palm oil traders alone, the ones I mentioned, account for about 60% of the world trade, so close to a tipping point. Their actions will send an unequivocal signal to the rest of the market. Now, the financial sector has equally responded by pledging to support sustainable commodity products. Investors are starting to use their leverage as well. But corporate commitments only tell obviously one part of the story. Just as important are the roles of government and civil society in all of this. To get to scale, we need to align business actions with public policy. One example of this is the Tropical Forest Alliance we've put together, created with the governments of Norway, the Netherlands, the UK, the US, Indonesia, Liberia, and dozens of NGOs. The goal? of the Tropical Forest Alliance is to help business remove deforestation from its entire supply chain, whilst promoting economic as well as social development. It is setting up practical work programs in places like Indonesia, Colombia, and now West Africa. Another one that Helen referred to is the New York Declaration on Forest, launched at the time of the Climate Summit in September in New York. It's pledged to halve deforestation by 2020 and to end it entirely by 2030. 
and restore 350 hectares of degraded forest is now endorsed by over 175 entities, countries, states, provinces, companies, indigenous leaders and NGOs, many undoubtedly here in the audience today. Helen has talked about its specific commitment, so I won't go into that. But I would like to reflect on how government actions can support the private sector ambitions. Because whilst the private sector can undoubtedly disrupt markets, it is only with government policy that we can transform markets and change the rules of the game for everyone. I ask tropical forest countries to implement the land use reforms necessary to grow your economies without destroying the forests. These include clarifying concessions and ownerships. It requires improving transparency, protecting the customary land rights of forest communities and indigenous people, strengthening the enforcement of forest laws and clamping down on illegal deforestation and aligning, last but not least, all relevant policies from financing to infrastructure. But it's not only national level policy, and it's encouraging to see increasingly cooperation between such national governments and the private sector at the same time. Such partnerships have the potential to deliver significant win-wins, guarantee traceability for companies, and increased investments for the states involved. This alignment of public and private incentives is one of the big wins within our grasp. And what is truly exciting is that just as we reach a tipping point in the private sector commitments, in my opinion, we're starting to work productively with forest communities and indigenous people as well. For too long, their lives and livelihoods have been a hidden and unaccountable for cost of the expansion of commodity production that has benefited the rest of us. Organizations like Koika and the Amazon Basin or Amen in Indonesia have played a big role in changing this and I would like to pay tribute to their commitment and their tenacity. Now developed countries have a role to play too. They can strengthen the signals sent by the private sector for deforestation free commodities, particularly through their procurement and trade policies. Very few actually do although they account often for 40-50% of total purchases. Some countries have made good progress, but we need more ambition here and coherence. We need an end to prefer subsidies or incentives for damaging biofuels that drive forest destructions and threaten food security at the same time. And we need the international community to prioritize Red Plus by enabling large-scale, predictable, and sustainable results-based financing for forest protection in a new climate agreement. Yes, we did see encouraging commitments in New York where countries came forward with new agreements to pay countries for reduced deforestation. As we look for ways to increase the ambition of the new climate agreement, I'm hopeful that here in Lima we can go well beyond what each country can do alone and explore how much more is possible if we finally start to work together. Critically, we need to ensure the level of ambition is high across the board and commensurate with the existing commitments to keep warming below the two degrees. Deforestation is not one of the great challenges in the fight against climate change. It is the most important and immediate and most urgent challenge in my opinion. We're not yet acting at either the speed or scale that the problem demands, but we can win this battle. I believe that we've never ever been so forewarned to do something about it, but I also believe that we've never ever been so forearmed to do something about it. If we tackle deforestation in the right way, the benefits will be far reaching. Greater food security, improved livelihoods for millions of small old farmers and indigenous people, and above all, a more stable climate. No doubt momentum is building, partnerships are forming. Now is the moment to accelerate our progress as we tackle this challenge together. Thank you very much.
Ms. Kakabadze, I invite you to the dais. <laughs>